In the previous video, we looked at some of the players in the management of fisheries and some of the problems that can arise. The solutions are numerous, diverse, and changing, so we're not going to be able to do them justice in these short videos. But let's look at a few of the charismatic options that are around today. In this video, we're going to look at individual and transferable quotas. One way of limiting fishing is by having an industry-wide quota. To enforce the quota, those in charge could ban fishing for some amount of time. Monitors look at past catches or population data, estimate how much can be taken, and decide how much fishing time the stock of fish can handle. Or they just open the season to fishing and monitor catches until the limit is reached and then close the season. But by just limiting effort, we haven't changed the incentives of the fishery. There's still money to be made for the individual by putting in more effort. So if we just limit the amount of time that they can spend fishing, just one of the factors that goes into the effort equation, the fishermen will adjust with bigger boats or more boats or better equipment. Because the fish they would have caught in that time are still there. And the fishermen are still free to exploit the fish and other fishermen are free to enter the fishery, so the industry as a whole just ends up reacting by putting in more effort with other means. Then the policymakers react by shortening the season again, and the fishermen react by putting in more effort. The end result isn't really a reduction in effort, but the creation of a very short fishing season, an increase in the fishermen's costs, and an increase in occupational hazard, because they can't wait for good weather and they need to pack as much fishing into that time as they can. The fisheries that operate like this can be some of the most dangerous professions in the world. One way to prevent this is by, instead of having an industry-wide quota, is by having individual quotas. So you basically take a portion of the total allowable catch and then split it up to give to all the fishermen. Normally it's an open access game and a fisherman doesn't have rights to the fish until they're in the boat. So they're managing their tools to try to get as much of the fish as they can. Instead, give them each an individual amount of the total quota. This way each fisherman knows more about how much fish they're going to get that season, so they know how much to invest in equipment and maybe when to go fishing. It's basically giving the fishermen the rights to a certain number of fish while they're still in the water. In theory, it's taking this rivalrous resource where people race to take from a pool of fish and separating it into non-rivalrous sections. This way there's less of a race to fish and fishermen can plan ahead. Just a simple system like this that we've been talking about doesn't get rid of all competition, but it's a step in the right direction. Also, by making these quotas tradable, you can get a more efficient outcome for how much each fisherman is fishing. Let's say we have a fishery with just two fishermen, who are each given half the season's quota for a stock of fish. We've been generally assuming up till now that all the boats are equal in their cost per unit effort, but that's not the case. Let's say in the beginning for this fisherman, that first bit of fish quota, that first hundred tons of fish, has a lot of value to him. He's got his ship and crew ready with nothing else to do, and it would be relatively easy and inexpensive to fish that first bunch of fish, so he's willing to pay a lot for those quotas. For the second hundredth ton, maybe to be able to fish that much, he would have to hire some additional crew, so if he had to buy more quotas, he would need the quotas to be a bit cheaper. They're a little bit less valuable to him because his costs are higher. If he gets even more quotas, he would need to hire even more crew or maybe pay them overtime wages or maybe he doesn't even think he can sell that much fish. So he continually values additional fishing rights less and less. In other words, his marginal value of fishing quotas decreases as he gets more of them. Okay, and let's say the other fisherman has a similar line. Her number of quotas comes in from the right here. This is his amount of quotas. This is her amount of quotas. Added together, they always have the total number of quotas. This just represents them trading. Okay, but let's say with her, maybe she has a more fuel efficient boat or she knows some great secret fishing spots or techniques or something that makes it so that she can fish for a bit cheaper. If she can fish for cheaper but the price of fish isn't changing, then she can make more money per fish. Which after all is said and done makes it so that she's able to pay more for fishing quotas. So her value per quota is higher. And let's say just like with him, her marginal benefit from another quota goes down as she gets more of them and her demand for quotas looks like this. Okay, so right now with the initial allocation, let's say they're each getting half to start for simplicity. In reality, these types of systems are generally distributed based on the fisherman's historical catches or current level of investment. Here at the initial allocation, she values quotas more than he does. So if the quotas were tradable, he would be willing to sell some of his quotas to her, and she would be willing to buy. To her, this quota is worth this much money, but she would be able to pay less than that to somebody who values the quotas less. To him, it's only worth this much, but there's somebody willing to pay more than that, so they would be willing to trade their quotas. After that, they're in a similar position, so they'll trade again, and they'll keep trading quotas until here. Now they value the quotas the same amount. 
she wouldn't buy any more past this point because he would expect more money than she cares to pay. This is the benefit of trading quotas. Allocate the quotas as fairly as you can in the beginning, then through trade they will reach an efficient allocation of how much each fisher is fishing based on their abilities and their preferences. Okay, let's say she was just way more efficient than he was at fishing. He doesn't value any of his quotas as much as she does. She would be willing to pay him for all his quotas and he would be willing to sell them all. So this means that he would make more money if he just fired his crew, didn't worry about equipment and gas and fishing, and just sold all of his rights to somebody who places a higher value on them. She's basically leasing all of his rights to fish for that period. This is another benefit. The system encourages some people to leave and the fishermen who remain, the ones who are gaining that extra rent from fishing, are the ones paying for the transition. This can sometimes mean that it's the offshore or large-scale commercial fishermen that end up with all the quotas since they can fish for cheaper, and it's probably the smaller, more labor-intensive boats that are losing out. This might be what you want, or it can be corrected by separating the total allowable catch into two sets of markets and restrict trade between the markets, or something. The benefit to allowing a market for quotas is that they take into account all of the fisherman's values. For example, yes, he may be less efficient than she is, but what if he really likes to fish? It's a family tradition and he's always loved it. In theory, this is going to raise the value of his quotas. He's going to take that into account. This is a made-up situation, but in theory, this is the benefit of a system like this. We, as policymakers, let's say, can sit here and try to find out or decide what the people want, what's important to them, who should be fishing, and how much, or just put the choice into the hands of the players who know the most about their costs, their revenue, and what they want. It lets him decide exactly what amount of money, if any, is required to make him stop fishing. One problem with individual transferable quotas, not necessarily exclusive to this system, but they may encourage wasteful behaviors like throwing back the smaller fish. Depending on the species, the larger fish might have more value per pound than the littler ones. So much so that it can be worthwhile to just throw back the little ones so they're not wasting their precious quotas on less valuable fish. Some species can survive being thrown back. I think something like 80% of halibut brought up and thrown back will actually survive, but other species like cod will die from the pressure difference. But individual transferable quota systems have seen some success. In 1980, in the Canadian province of British Columbia, it took 65 days for the fishermen to catch 5.7 million pounds of Pacific halibut. By 1990, because of more advanced technologies, it took them 6 days to catch 8.5 million pounds. Policymakers tried to limit catch by limiting the length of the season, but just like we've been talking about, it didn't eliminate the incentive to race to fish. So the fishery attracted too many fishermen, the fishermen overinvested in equipment, they had to deal with unsafe working conditions, and something we didn't talk about before. Because the fishermen were getting a huge supply in a very short time period, the fish has less value per pound because of the abundance and because it's probably going to have to be sold frozen. And with six days of crazy fishing, it's even harder for monitors to know what the population is at. The actual catch in this system was always greater than the total allowable catch. They decided to do a trial run testing individual quotas. After starting in 1991, the total catch was actually below the total allowable catch. The fishing season changed from six days of derby style fishing producing frozen fish of lesser value to a 218 day season. The fishing being more spread out with them able to provide fresh fish at a greater value. In that first year of trying the individual quotas, the revenue of the industry increased. After trading was allowed, the number of vessels decreased as fishermen sold their quotas. And apparently overall fishing costs also decreased, although I couldn't find data to put it on the graph. Biological monitoring, catch monitoring, and enforcement increased as quota holders were expected to supplement the funding. In 1992, 91% of the fishers voted to continue the program. So an individual quota system helps reduce competition, helps the fishermen plan out their tools and how they're going to spend their time, which can decrease their costs, increase their revenue, and make things safer. Does it help the fish stock? They don't really seem to. Something like 10% of all fisheries today are managed with some sort of individual quota system, but on average they don't really display a healthier fish stock or an increase in catches compared to other management systems. Which makes sense, really. How much fish is caught is still based on how well management can estimate fish stock size, measure fish catches, and accurately decide the quota, and then monitor the fishermen's activities. What's mostly changed is just the fishermen's relationship to the total allowable catch. 
But because the system is more efficient, more efficient meaning there would be more money being made for the same amount of fish being caught, some of that money can and should be rolled back into monitoring, enforcement, etc. that pushes the industry towards the maximum economic yield. We really just scratched the surface on these kinds of systems but you know we're out of time. In the next video we're going to look at management by space or territory rather than just by a single species like we've been looking at in this video.